All right, so good. We have enough time for categorical variables. So categorical variables. Um, I'm going to use the auto MPG that was from the curriculum. Um, this is kind of based around like cars and stuff like this, just different values of like um, attributes of the car and stuff like this. Um, I don't know if anyone's a car person who like would be familiar with these values where this is where domain knowledge is super useful. But um, you'll see here MPG, miles per gallon, uh, cylinders, uh, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, model year, origin, car name, right? And I think the idea here is that MPG will actually be our target variable. So we're trying to predict the miles per gallon. Um, so how efficient are these cars? So one thing is that we can quickly look at this right here. And obviously car name is not gonna be a numerical value, right? Obviously this is not gonna be um, at least usable in a regre uh, linear regression. We might have to do some transformation or we might just ignore it completely. But um, some other things in here that are kind of interesting for example, like clearly um, displacement, whatever exactly that means, you know, in this context, uh, seems to be on a continuous spectrum, right? Um, horsepower, well, we're kind of familiar with horsepower. It's like, oh, you know, that seems like a continuous uh, spectrum. Uh, weight, well, that definitely would be a continuous, right? Because there's different values you can have. Um, cylinders, you know, we can imagine like, well, we probably can't have half of the cylinder, like not likely, maybe we can, you know? This is where expiration comes in. So the good thing about it is first, we just kind of look into investigate, you know, our different values. and. I'm not going to spend too much time, but you guys know how to do your dot info, dot describe, basically do some basic exploration, see if there's any weirdness in here. Um, for example, you can see for cylinders, uh, we have the minimum of three and then our maximum of eight. So there's not a huge widespread of values in here. And if you look carefully at the, the fact that there's like, um, like uh, what's it called? If you look at like our min, our 25%, our 50%, it looks like these things are integers, right? It's possible maybe we have, you know, a decimal in there, but it seems like most of these are likely integers. And we can actually look at it here on the dot info. Yeah, it's an integer. So we expect those parts to basically not vary too much. So one thing we can do to kind of explore this data is um, these different subplots. So I think this is actually like what the curriculum kind of shows and everything like that. Um, one thing I really like using is pair plots. Have we seen this in the curriculum, pair plot? No? If you, you'll recognize it if you, you've seen it before. Um, oh, still processing. There we go. Kids seen this before? Yeah, I really like pair plots for Seaborn. Um, basically what happens here is that each um, on the x-axis and the y-axis here are the different features or at least whatever you feed it the data. Um, in this case, the target's also in there, MPG here. And you can basically see them plotted off against each other. So you basically look at two dimensions at a time. And what's kind of nice, you can very quickly see, for example, for miles per gallon, um, you can kind of see how these all relate, but you can also see these really straight lines versus like these kind of more like cloudy kind of like look and stuff like this. And the reason why we have these straight lines here is because those values only exist as like the data points only exist at these certain values. So you have these straight lines. And this is the stuff we're looking out for. It's like, hey, these are probably categorical variables. Um, you can also see it in like, if you notice this diagonal line, this is the distribution of the data points, right? In that value. So for example, MPG versus MPG will always be a straight line, right? These will always be straight lines. So instead of just writing a straight line, which is kind of useless, um, Seaborn, at least in the pair plot, will actually plot out the distribution for that certain value. So I know it's kind of small here, but you can see here, for example, um, I actually don't know what this value is. I think cylinder is what this is. You can, um, yeah, cylinders. I'm going to pretend it's cylinders. So the cylinders value here, you can see that there's very specific values. Um, but even some of these other ones that might be more categorical, for example, this very last one. Oh my gosh, I can't even read this very well. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but you can kind of see that it has this very like stripped like feeling to it. And you can't, you might not immediately see it from this value here, like from the distribution. And you can clearly see it from when you compare these certain parts. Those are gonna be categorical because they make more sense to be like, oh, there's certain values you can ex that exist. Um, and it's not like, again, like not much of a cloud. So it's here. Oh, okay, I was just showing the distributions. Oh, here, you can see it a lot easier. So this is a uh, model year. So I was not wrong. Model year was that one right here. So you can kind of imagine here. Um, and so what's kind of cool is that we can actually take these uh, these variables, say, oh, these are likely categorical variables um, based on different pair plots. Um, there's not really, like, there's not a straightforward way of just being like, oh, these are categories other than this being like not numbers. Um, so this is where visualizing your data is very important to understand because sometimes values that look kind of um, continuous, for example, like I would say model years in this case looks more categorical than a spectrum. Um, and that possibly could be because 
you know, you can kind of think of like a 1970s car versus a 1980s car. That feels more like a category in the sense versus like a 1981, 1982, 1983, at least for miles per gallon. It likely means that those things together probably are suggestive of this. And what's kind of cool, you can actually see this in the data itself. Um, in particular, we see like 1970 and then 1980, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. But I was going to say if there's specific peaks at like decades, for example, maybe, for example, they just say, oh, it's a 1980s car, even though it's like 1983, which would suggest even more the data suggests that this is being treated as a categorical data. Does that make sense how I kind of pull this information from? Cool. So then once we have nodes and categoricals, like what do we do? There's a couple things we can do. Um, one is that we can actually do some label encoding. So this, I'm going to show you guys two different ways we can do this, which is dummy variables and label encoding. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to grab cylinders, uh, which is an integer, and we can see the distribution. Where's cylinders? There's cylinders. You can see there's not that many. Most of them are four cylinders. Looks like six cylinders and eight cylinders. Yeah, that right. Yeah. So we can kind of check this out right here. We can print it out. Uh, we can actually, I'm sorry, we can actually change this out to a category itself. So we can actually say to Panda, say, hey, this is now a category type. So what makes it nice about this is that now if I look at, for example, like uh, data.info, you can actually see it treats as a category. So we say, oh, that is a category and Pandas can actually do something differently with it. Um, we can also see what the unique values are too. So you can see here, for example, there's not that many values, which we saw in the histogram itself. Um, and then this cat codes right here. So we actually take the category, oops, the category and giving it a specific code. So what happens is like, even though it's eight, four, six, three, five, um, it will just basically give a value between one and, um, well, you'll see what's unique. You can see basically zero, one, two, three, four. And so the idea there, and you can see it's matched up actually with those values. The idea here is that maybe, for example, you have something that's already categories um, you want to say, well, okay, maybe for example, it's like, let's say the letter A. It's like, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, we're just going to give it the value zero, saying, like, oh, it's a different category. It's category zero, it's category one, category two. Um, this is also important for uh, cylinders because maybe cylinders, you know, even though they increase in value, maybe it actually makes more sense to consider them being like just a different value. Um, this is where, for example, like when you have numbers, for example, is a four cylinder car like really twice as good as like an eight or is an eight cylinder car twice as good as a four cylinder car i don't know exactly you know that might not be what we're looking for in the miles per gallon it might make more sense to consider it as a separate category by itself um, and that's the reason why we can give these actual codes in here um, an alternative way to this is using sklearn which we'll use a lot in using label encoder it'll do the same exact thing basically giving it between zero and whatever the um what's it called like start with zero and then different categories. In this case, there's only three different categories for origin. Uh, so zero, one, two. But if I did it, for example, like data with cylinders, I don't think it'll work with cylinders now. Oh, no, it does. You can see here, it does the same exact thing. So nice thing to use. Um, I'm a little at time, but I'm gonna finish up with dummy variables. So one other thing we can do is called dummy variables. So this basically transforms the values instead of keeping whatever the original value is into like zero, one, two, three, or whatever, however many categories there are and giving a certain code for that category. Dummy variables is kind of similar, but instead it's gonna actually create a different column. So if, for example, we have origin here and basically what's gonna happen, it's gonna either say on, the, on this specific um, column, this is origin one, this is origin two, this is origin three, essentially. And what's going to happen, it's going to say, okay, for each data point, which is on the row here, it's going to say, is it origin one? Yes, put a one. And therefore, is it origin two? Well, no, obviously, because it's one, zero, zero. So the idea here is that you one hot encode. So one hot encode, that's where the one comes from. Essentially saying, oh, it is this category, make a one on there. Okay. And you can see here, for example, the data point, this would be origin three, since it's basically zero, zero, one. Um, so quick thing. Can you ever have two ones in this if these are all the same, uh, from, come from the same category? Yeah, good, head shake is no, right? So basically it can only be one of these values. So one thing to consider though, if we do, um, and also, oh, I just wanted to show an alternative way with sklearn, you can do it this way as well, but pandas has a get dummies function that does this, does it for you. Um, one thing to consider is that when you have this, uh, you have to be kind of aware is that the way you do this, and this is where the curriculum talks about like dropping one of these uh, categories, is that if you know it's not one and you know it's not two, it has to be three, right? So this is the reason why we actually tend to drop out one, basically um, 
preventing multicollinearity. And so we're kind of out of time right now, but I'll, next time I'll actually kind of talk about multicollinearity, we'll talk about linear regression. Um, but there's some reasons why we do this, and it also helps with interpretability. It also means that the intercept will change. So if I drop out this uh, value in the about, like this number three right here, what's gonna happen is that that, like, if you imagine origin three, maybe it means the miles per gallon is gonna go up by 10 miles per gallon. That will actually be incorporated into the intercept. And we'll talk about that next time too. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, I know I'm a little over time. I do have to head out. Um, but uh, before I leave, just a reminder, um, please fill out the survey form for available times for um, pair programming. And then next time we'll talk about pair programming activity and pair you guys up into groups. Okay. All right, everyone. Take care. Bye. Right. Thank Have you. Have a good night.